Good evening, and welcome to Otis Jerry's Creepypasta Crypt. In the mood for a tasty pasta to increase your adrenaline rush. Well, you've come to the right place. Pull up a chair, get some popcorn, put your feet up, and have a listen, if you dare. <laughs> What is Dead? By Braden Powell Narrated by Otis Jiry I write this as an apology to those who are offended by my mistakes. I hope that you can find it in your hearts to forgive me, though I will understand if you can't. My wife was terminally ill, and a few months ago she died. I was very sad at the losses. She was a marvelous, caring woman. She was kind, and everyone that met her said their lives were better for it. I couldn't bear the pain, though, so I did something terrible. I will not tell you how I did it or how I learned to, for enough damage has been done. But I found a way to bring her back, to raise her from the dead. I could no longer bear to be alone, and I made a terrible mistake in my loneliness. When I finished the ritual, nothing happened, not at first, anyway. I was about to rebury her when I first started to hear breathing. With an understandable measure of joy, I realized that the sound was emanating from her mouth. I had done it. At the time, I could not fully understand what it was, but in my blissful ignorance, I carried her home. She was not the same. She was no longer caring, but a primal, instinctive beast. She howled and screamed, snarled at me whenever I passed. I was worried, not for my own sake, but for hers. She could escape. She could go out and do something to get hurt. Let the record show that it was for her own good that I locked her in my basement. I never meant to keep her that way. I never knew what my actions would set a chain reaction of unfathomable horrors into action. I kept her there for as long as I could, but her screams grew more and more desperate. I was chilled to my very core by the screams of my betrothed, and before long, I stood on the rain-slick precipice of insanity. I needed to do something. And so it happened. I was not the only one to hear the screams. My neighbors began to show interest, eventually sneaking onto my estate to snoop around. I caught them in the act, and as I had no explanation for what they may have seen, I attacked them. I didn't kill them, but they were unable to leave of their own accord, and as I feared the consequences of letting them go, I locked them in the basement with my wife. This was my second mistake. The first, of course, being that I raised her in the first place. That night, I knew the sound of crunching bone. Upon my awakening in the morning, I went down to check on the neighbors. One was gone. The other was wide-eyed, cowering in the corner and covered in blood. Something else was off, too, though at first I didn't know what. Then it hit me. The screams had subsided. My wife was asleep. She had fed, and now she slumbered. All this time, the screams were of hunger. I shut the door and went to lie down. She lasted a few more days, obviously, feasting on the other neighbor. It seemed that she only needed to eat once every few days. Now, I'm not proud of what I did next, but I didn't know what else to do. I went out at night every few days around the time that only a few people would still be around. I stalked the streets and attacked people who walked alone. I would take them back to my wife and leave them in the basement. I would often wake from my slumber to hear their screams, cries for help. This would always rouse the beast and would never last longer than a minute or two. Ten minutes of crunching and gurgling, please, later, the deed would be done, and I could rest easy for another few days. Although I did not kill anyone, I may as well have. 
It was my actions that brought about the deaths of so many, and my actions that robbed so many of loved ones, of closure. How many torn and bloodied rags did I have to burn? How many personal effects were destroyed by my hands? I lost track of the numbers, but surely even one is too high a number. I was kept awake by its screams, and it shall henceforth be referred to as it, for I have come to the conclusion that this monster is not my beloved. So I fed it, and out of rest for the lives of so many. Day by day it grew stronger, its strength increasing or returning, for I know not what horrible beast is now in possession of my wife's body, and as time went on I was forced to bring more food home. Bigger people, men, two women, a woman and a man. Eventually it was eating a full-grown man every day. I knew in some dark corner of my mind I knew that this could not go on forever. I could not keep taking people. I was in danger of being caught, and though I deserved to be, fear took hold of me, and that, I suppose, is why I let that charade go on for as long as it did. So I decided to flee. I had just packed my bags when I heard a knock on the door. The police had found a trail of blood leading through the woods up to my estate and were inquiring as to whether I'd seen or heard anything suspicious. I managed to keep a cool head and talk my way out of what could have potentially been a very unpleasant situation. I know not why, only that I deserved it. It began to scream. It screamed louder than I had ever heard it scream before, and it sounded mad. The police instantly drew their guns and went in, thinking perhaps some horrific predatory beast had made its way into my home. They eventually found my basement door and threw it open. Slowly, ever so slowly, they descended the stairs. I was at a loss for what to do, so I did the only thing I could think of in the heat of the moment. I shut the door. Throwing the bolt across, I ran to my quarters and grabbed my bags, making for the door. The screams of the police haunt me to this very day. I heard the sound of splintering wood as that thing burst out of its cell. It was now loose in the house. I ran as fast as my legs could carry me out of there, out into the street of the town I had stopped, into a train, and I left that place far behind. My old home is a ghost town now, splashed with blood, yet no bodies remain. How I long to return to my estate, to gather up all of my research, and burn it so that this might never happen again. I've made my any attempt to do so. In fact, though every time I get near, I hear that beast's wild howl screaming for flesh. I know it haunts my home now. I know it wears my wife's skin. But the worst part of all of this, I let it happen. Hi, Otis Jiry here. Thanks for joining me around the digital campfire today. Your support means everything to me. I wanted to take a moment to ask you to support me and help me make storytelling my career by joining the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights members area. There are links in the video description below. If you love what I do, help me make this my full-time job by signing up for any membership of your choice. With your support, I can quit my day job and dedicate my day to putting out more twisted tales more regularly and take more of your requests. With a membership, not only do you get instant access to my archive of 200 plus audio stories in HD format, but you'll get them weeks or months before the public does. You'll also get access to the full archive of hundreds of fully produced Chilling Tales for Dark Nights tales including several narrated by me, and advanced access there as well. In addition to that, you'll get exclusive members-only access to private monthly livestream events and direct access to me and the rest of the team via the Direct Connect and Production Lounge